This week on Heal Yourself Radio, we're talking about brain-based fitness with Troy Dodson. Troy is a personal trainer that focuses on functional neurology, and he uses these functional neurological methods to help people improve their performance, resist injury, recover from injury, and he really has a unique background with a wide variety of uh, topics in fitness and how the brain involve, is involved with the overall concept of fitness. After the success of the Matt Antonucci interview, you should go check that out about brain hacking, um, PRs for CrossFit. Um, I think you'll really enjoy what Troy is going to be talking about here today. As always, if you're enjoying what you're hearing, check out HealYourselfRadio.com for the show notes, and you'll find links to the, all the resources that we talk about on the show. And you can also sign up for our newsletter. And additionally, if you are really enjoying the show and you like what we're doing, uh, we love getting feedback on iTunes. So if you write us a review on iTunes, we read all of them and they really help us make the show better. So if you like what we're doing, go check out iTunes and give us a nice little review. Uh, without further ado, enjoy this interview with Troy Dodson. You're listening to the Heal Yourself Radio Podcast. Unleash the Doctor Within with your hosts, Dr. Jonathan Chung and Dr. Gregory Jean-Pierre. Welcome to another episode of Heal Yourself Radio. It's Dr. Jonathan Chung with you, bringing you the best info and guests about trends in fitness, health, nutrition, and overall healthcare so that you can have the tools to pick the provider that you need, and to be able to have the tools to really be able to heal yourself. Today I have a guest with me. His name is Troy Dodson of Brain Based Fitness. Uh, Troy has a really unique approach to fitness and that he sees it as beyond something working on, beyond just working on muscles and getting your heart rate better, but he sees it as an approach to improve brain function and improving overall health through your brain function. And uh, I'm very excited to pick his brain and learn a little bit more about what you're doing. Welcome to the show, Troy. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. So why don't you give us a little bit of an overview of what it means uh, to look at fitness from a brain-based perspective? Yeah. So um, the way I see it, um, the, the brain is the ultimate target of all exercise. Um, exercise essentially, you know, no matter what type of exercise you're performing, it's essentially all movement-based. Uh, movement is a core component of any exercise, and uh, movement is entirely controlled by the brain. Uh, some of it is voluntary movement, so that's initiated, controlled by the, you know, like the frontal cortex, and other movements are more um, reflexively controlled. So, like, for instance, if you're going to press a dumbbell overhead with one arm, that would be the voluntary movement side, and then the other side has to you know, create enough stability and postural alignment in order to have a stable platform to press the weight from. Otherwise, you would basically lose balance or not be able to move it in the direction you want to move it. So it's pretty interesting to look at it through that lens and um, and then look for opportunities to help improve, you know, both uh, movement, balance, and stabilization and posture, um, which is going to create a better outcome in terms of better movement and therefore better, you know, workouts. Awesome. And how did you come on to this idea? What drove you down this path to uh, making your training practice more so brain-based? Well, um, it started when I, um, I I started one of the early CrossFit gyms, affiliate gyms, back in 2005. And prior to that, I'd had some experiences um, with doing some, you know, quote unquote, like nervous system hacks that that made some functional improvements for myself. It wasn't anything spectacular, just you know, some strength-based stuff. And it's enough for me to kind of open my eyes to the idea of using the nervous system to uh, create the changes in the body that you need. And so I started up, you know, in early CrossFit affiliate. I think it was like October of '05, and you know, within probably three to six months. You know, I and this is back when nobody was hating on CrossFit, by the way, because nobody knew what it was. <laughs> but um, you know, you know, I was, I was noticing, um, you know, a lot of my clients had mobility issues, or they had coordination issues, or they had trouble learning new movements and skills, 
and you know using a lot of the common coaching uh, you know best practices you know led a lot of people to either compensate more or um, you know they just didn't make the progress or they were getting injured and so I basically sought out to find um, something I could use to kind of help change the nervous system to create um, the improvements that we wanted and that led me to um, a neurology based movement system called GL performance solutions and so I basically got linked up with them in 2006 and they they're basically an education company um, that teaches uh, neurology in a way that is useful for you know trainers or any other um, you know health practitioner like physical therapists or even you know DCs and stuff like that um, so through that um, just over the years I've you know got the opportunity to apply it to lots of uh, you know, CrossFit type athletes and some other sport athletes. And um, I think in 2012, um, kind of took a leap into um, functional neurology, um, got kind of plugged into that through uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Freddie Garcia, and really good guy. Um, and so since then, you know, just been kind of applying, um, applying that to my business. So. Um, I essentially sold my CrossFit gym in 2013, uh, took a detour for about a year, and then decided to refocus on, on this brain-based type training and started at Brain-Based Fitness RX um, pretty much a year ago, maybe a little bit over a year ago. And it's going great. Seeing a lot of cool changes in people. Awesome. What was the name of that company that you were talking about? It was called Zero Performance? or? Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. It's, uh, it's Z, like the first letter in Zebra, Z Health. Performance okay. Solutions. So I think their website's like zhealtheducation.com. Okay. Cool. I'll definitely uh, look that up and check it out. <clears throat> so what are some of the types of clientele that you work with? Who are the people that you see can benefit the most from a brain-based approach to fitness? Well, <laughs> um, well, pretty much anybody that's got a brain can potentially benefit <laughs> from it, um, oddly enough. But um, but no, I mean, from a business standpoint, who I like to work with the most and who I'm able to help the most tend to be athletes. Um, a lot of that comes down to um, their mindset and their willingness to do whatever is going to help them improve their performance. Um, but I do get a lot of referrals for weird cases, and those tend to be people who have been struggling with uh, issues that they haven't been able to to get help with in the traditional medical, you know, route. Um, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> That's really interesting. Um, do you have any um, interesting case studies you'd like to share? Because I saw some of the stuff that you've posted on your uh, Facebook page and your website where, you know, you have athletes that are gaining like an inch on their vertical leap and, I um, mean, taking all of these quantifiable things and seeing some pretty remarkable changes on it. Yeah, actually, uh, on that on that note, I recently worked with a volleyball athlete. And keep in mind, this is a young athlete who has quite a bit of uh, postural and movement limitations. Um, so it's not like I'm talking about a pro athlete that's already at a high level. Um, but in, in a uh, two-week time span, I think we had a total of seven training sessions. Um, and she had a six-inch increase in her vertical jump during that time. Six-inch increase. That is incredible. Well, what's, what makes it more incredible, actually, is, um, see, she was driving, uh, her mom was driving her a couple hours each direction to come to these training sessions. And uh, and what was really interesting about it was um, I completely spaced out and forgot that her last day was her last day. And uh, so I, I was basically doing a combination of some... Uh, you know, neurological training, uh, vision vestibular, um, some mobility stuff, that kind of stuff with her. And we would do that in the beginning, and then we would finish up with like a 30-minute workout that was kind of geared towards vertical jump type stuff. And um, and so we were actually in the middle of the workout when I remembered that, oh, yeah, today's your last day, and we were supposed to check your vertical jump, you know, actually test it, and I'd forgotten to. So... I said, hey, why don't you go ahead and jump off that? You know, she was using this, uh, we, you know, we use a um, 
I mean, what's that thing called? It's, a, it's called an MVP. It's like an MVP shuttle. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's basically a way to train vertical jumps uh, where you can load it, and it's kind of like on a horizontal platform that you lay down on, and uh, you can do squats and you can do jumps on that. And you, you can use these resistance bands to basically adjust it, and it allows you to kind of uh, see the movement errors a little bit easier because of the position they're in, and they can also feel um, and they can also look at it themselves where you point out, you know, hey, your knee's falling in and, you know, that kind of thing. It's just it's a useful training tool that I found. And so she was on that, and I had her jump off, and we went and set up the uh, Vertec and, and tested her uh, vertical jump, and she gained six inches. You know, this is mid-workout. So uh, there's no telling what it, what it could have been if we um, had, had tried it out for us, you know. Okay. So was there anything that... When you first stumbled upon this, was there anything you had going on for yourself that this made a big difference for you? Like, how did it change your life in any meaningful way? Oh man, um, I don't even know where to start with that. Um, I'm <laughs> kind of a I'm kind of a unique case that um, I've had some major surgeries. Um, I was born premature, had a open heart surgery. Um, when I was 20, I had like a small intestine uh, resection where they took out basically a foot. Um, you know, had had some crazy injuries and stuff, some head injuries, and and so yeah, I mean, basically, I I uh, was one of those guys that you know, doing CrossFit early on, when my stress levels were low and my body function was good, I was able to um, handle it really well and recover well and and and, and make very good progress. Um, uh, doing CrossFit and, and uh, always handled it well, but over the years, you know, with having, you know, kids and, you know, chronic stress, with you know, business stress, that kind of stuff, um, you know, with all the compensations that I had developed with all the, you know, previous surgeries and things of that nature, um, it was just something that wasn't sustainable, and I got to the point where my function was so bad that if I worked out, even doing a moderate workout, I'd be sore for like nine days. I just couldn't recuperate from workouts. And, you know, I would just get completely completely destroyed by stuff. Um, so it was it was pretty crazy and, you know, quite the learning curve uh, going through the neurology and supporting that. Um, and then that led me more to working on lots of nutritional type supports to kind of help, the ner- help support the nervous system with its changes. Um, and then a lot of scar tissue type work. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, through the process, I've definitely uh, been able to kind of restore my health and uh, get everything back on track. And and so yeah, it's been quite the quite the experience. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, uh, would you like me to give you a couple examples of some client cases and stuff? Yeah, go ahead. Cool. So um, I recently worked with a high level gymnast that um, um, she had experienced an injury, um, I think it was like early spring, uh, where she had fallen uh, with a lot of force on her tailbone. And um, she'd had chronic pain ever since then and had trouble uh, getting over that. So she'd she'd actually flown out to see the team specialist. He's like a a osteopathic uh, doctor up in Detroit. And... um, you know, got a really good assessment from him and um, got prescribed certain physical therapy things and was seeing a chiropractor, very good chiropractor in the area as well. And, uh, you know, making progress but not getting to the root of it. You know, the pain wasn't um, actually getting better. Um, and so through the course of the assessments with me where I'm working with her, um, you know, we were finding out that she um, – she basically had some stuff going on, uh, a lot, a lot of things, but definitely with the brainstem uh, not functioning as well as you know we'd like. So she would have sweaty palms all the time, and not able to regulate that, and um, you know checking stuff like the temporal lobe, which has to do with the hippocampus, and that has to do with cortisol regulation. You know all those systems that are going to help control the perspiration and things like that. Um, it was fairly interesting because, you know, just having her count down from 100, um, she wasn't even able to do that. She'd get to like 93 and get stuck. Um, so we start looking at temporal level a little more. I'd give her a series of numbers to repeat back to me, kind of like a phone number. Um, 
And, you know, if you say it with, like, rhythm and tone changes, she could uh, repeat it back to me, no problem, because that's kind of using more of, like, the right side. And then, you know, if we do it, like, in a monotone voice, she would literally uh, screw up four out of the seven numbers and, you know, really choke trying to get the numbers out. Uh -huh. And uh, and so, you know, we moved from that on to, like, basic math problems. You know, here she is. She's, like, 14 and really smart. And... Um, you know, definitely good at math. And, you know, I start having her go through, like, these addition flashcards where it's, like, 3 plus 4 equals what, you know, that kind of stuff. And she's flipping through as quick as she can and thinking the answer to herself. And she literally got about five cards into it at a quick pace and started getting slower. And about three cards later, she got stuck on a card and couldn't go on for about 20, 30 seconds. And she said, I just don't know what to do. I'm stuck. <laughs> so... It was really interesting to see these high-level brain systems that were just completely fatiguing out on her. And it, it turned out that there was a huge nutrition component that we had overlooked. And getting her to modify her diet intake and to, and to do some different things that help stabilize blood sugar, and literally within days, the palm sweating was was reduced to where it wasn't happening as much. Her range of motion and pain were improved. And, and she was able to compete in her tournament this past weekend uh, without pain and and she's able to do all the moves in her routine and stuff like that, which is a really big deal for her. That's awesome. Um, where did you get your functional neurology training in? Um, so uh, there was a course taught through Z Health Performance that um, it's called Structure, and um, that was basically a collaboration between a functional neurologist and the owner of, uh, of Z Health Performance and um, since then, that was probably a few years ago, I think 2012, is that rings a bell. Um, since then, Dr. Cobb, the guy that owns Z-Health, uh, one of his strengths in life, in my opinion, is the ability to take stuff that's extremely complex and hard to learn and simplify it and make it a lot more useful in the process. And um, so, you know, each consecutive year, I've basically gone back to the same course, but it's been a basically... Uh, like a, a completely different course each time because of the way that they have refined it. Um, so, you know, if you look at, like, the, the most extreme hard cases that functional neurologists out there in the world are treating successfully, you know, taking the approach that we learn through the ZL system, you know, we're probably not going to be able to do all the same things. Um, but at the, same at the same time, with a lot of cases, you know, with athletes and stuff, we can get to solutions pretty quick and um and so it's it's useful in that regard you know yeah sure <clears throat> well that's that's pretty awesome um, yeah i was actually um i was talking to my buddy who's um he's over at life university he's a student there so he's um you know embarking on his uh, dc career you know in school and uh he's he's a part of the functional neurology um club and going through all the training with the care institute and stuff like that and, uh, you know, we were talking about this case I had yesterday because I got referred uh, a family member of a client who was in town, and she has uh, tremors. She's like 33 years old with tremors all the time, and she's seen a medical neurologist and gotten meds for it. Um, she's on two different meds and uh, has a history of some gut problems like C. difficile, you know, things like that in the past. Uh, had several surgeries, so... In the session working with her, um, you know, we were talking about this as like a, a good example of um, some of the differences between the approach that I'm taking through the Z Health method and uh, functional neurology. And um, you know, I kind of honed in on she had a uh, she had a spot on her arm on her left side that had a lot more like she had like five surgeries in that area uh, had like rods and screws and stuff installed. Um, and so I focused in on that scar, and she had probably about five tattoos at least, uh, mostly on the left side as well, but also on her back and the other side of her body. And just doing, like, soft tissue work on the scars and the tattoos, um, we were able to get her tremors to greatly reduce. They actually stopped for a period of time, um, and uh, her range of motion improved, her muscle strength improved. Um, when we did muscle testing, it was kind of like... Um, it's kind of like, you know, those old school um, sprinklers that people used to put in their front guards and they would kind of like, yeah. you know, rotate. It's like testing her hamstrings was like that. You know, it was like on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off throughout the whole muscle test. And any muscle test you did, it was like that. 
Um, and then at the end, she was able to hold a nice strong contraction on any muscle that we tested. So her cerebellum just wasn't, you know, kicking on and staying on, you know. That's really pretty great. cool. Yeah. Um, I know one of the big things that we were talking about before is, um, you know, just quantifying a lot of the things that you're doing and measuring the nervous system. Um, I want to talk a little bit about heart rate variability, um, and I'm going to have you describe heart rate variability a little bit and how you use it uh, to in your fitness measurements. Okay, cool. Um, so heart rate variability is essentially um, something that started in the 60s in terms of research and development. And it used to be uh, mostly popular or just popular with uh, high-level sports teams and athletes. Um, the, the equipment you used to have to have um, was the kind of stuff you'd see in a lab and, you know, very expensive and, and you'd have to have a PhD to operate it. And now the technology is compressed to where um, you, can, you can use uh, an iPhone or an Android phone to, uh, to, run it, to run an app. And... You can use like a finger sensor or a heart rate strap in order to take measurements. So basically what you do is you take a, a daily measurement, usually in the morning upon rising. Um, the more consistent you can make that, how you do the measurement, the better the data is that you get. And essentially the app builds, um, is, is taking a measurement between heartbeats and looking for the timing differential between heartbeats. Um, because that's an indication as to um, you can extrapolate how, I guess, how balanced the autonomic nervous system is between the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is essentially your stress response system that's going to um, be activated whenever there's a stressor. So uh, even just, you know, if you have to move your arm to pick up a cup on your desk, your sympathetic nervous system has to increased blood pressure, for instance, in order to make that movement happen. So it's definitely more the case. You can see that with uh, workouts. If we're working out and exercising, that's definitely um, a stressor on the system. And as soon as we're done exercising, we want to be able to quickly switch over to uh, parasympathetic nervous system dominance in order to start the rest and digest you know, process to help recover from the stress we just endured. And so HRV gives you a measure of, you know, how well those two systems are working and, you know, kind of gives you an idea of, like, how well you're outputting on the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay. And what are the most common deficiencies you see when you're measuring HRV? Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, what are some of the most common deficiencies that you see in, like, your average athlete when it comes to HRV? Well, like when they're, um, you know, you're looking at the baseline that gets created, so it's kind of like a seven-day um, trailing average, and you're looking to see kind of if that's trending up or down to make training decisions. And, you know, there's quite a few times I've seen where you get an athlete that um, they tend to have like a very low trailing average, um, so meaning the HRV score tends to be low. Uh, maybe a lot of variance, like where it bounces between highly sympathetic or highly parasympathetic, um, and they don't really get much of a strong parasympathetic tone. Um, so that HRV score tends to stay low as a result. Um, and, you know, those folks are people that if you weren't measuring things, you look at them and go, yeah, I think you're, you know, quote, unquote, overtraining or, you know, under recovering, however you want to look at it. Um, you should probably, you know, rest some more and and maybe do less work, you know, things of that nature. Um, the, one of the benefits I've seen is being able to give objective data to that kind of scenario because as a coach, you know, you have those clients that sometimes are re really stubborn and they kind of have their own ideas of how things should be and harder is better and harder is like the only way forward for them kind of thing. And so that in a way, you know, since adaptation only occurs if you can recover from the stress, or your body can adequately respond to the stress. In, in some ways, they become kind of like their own worst, you know, enemy in terms of making progress. Um, so I've seen HRV be able to kind of inform those athletes that, you know, this is where you're at. Let's do this experiment. 
and let's try changing this one thing like sleep or, you know, whatever it is that's the most important thing for them, uh, whether it's sleep or um, nutrition or maybe there's an insufficiency of some sort of nutrient um, or maybe there's just weak output from the parasympathetic nerve system. Um, so, like, the output comes from the vagus nerve, which is this big nerve that goes to your organs from your brainstem. And... Um, and it's also the summation of that along with other things like the total output of, of the vestibular system, um, some other cranial nerves that have to do with like moving the jaw and sensation on the face and moving the tongue um, and some others. Um, so there's a lot to the par parasympathetic nerve system. And if they have a strong enough deficiency in any of those things, then they can have a weaker parasympathetic output and then tend to not recover as well. And for the people that are really kind of stubborn about it, it's it's really good from a coaching standpoint to be able to say, hey, look, here's where we are now. Let's try this for the next week, and let's see what this does. And then we can see some measurable improvements, uh, and then they can associate that with, like, feeling better or maybe having better workouts. Um, then they can really start to um, start adopting the mindset of, of making sure they do the lifestyle things they need to in order to adapt to the stress they're creating in the workouts. Okay. What's your favorite HRV tool to use for your clients? Um, yeah, I really like uh, my iAthlete.com. <laughs> I can't say that well. It's uh, it's like the word athlete with an A, but instead of an A at the beginning, it's an I. So it's okay. iAthlete. Yeah. Uh, so my iAthlete.com, that is uh, a pretty good system. Um, they've had research, I think, um, I think there's a, a, PhD, a PhD student. Um, his name is Andrew Flat. He he's uh, done a lot of work to validate their system, um, and also has done a lot of work with like associating improvements in the HRV baseline with improvements made in performance and fitness for uh, team sports like soccer and other sports. Okay, um, and he. he um, He's got a lot of good info on the web. Um, his, uh, let's see here, his blog, I think it's like hrvtraining.com. And if he's already a PhD, if he's gotten that already, I apologize. I just didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm actually pulling up the website right now, so I'll attach that into the show notes for anyone that's interested in looking that up. Okay. Um, do you have any specific types of programming that you recommend for people for, you know, what's a good general baseline type of programming for someone who's looking to um, just enhance their brain function and may have a positive impact on something like HIV? Okay. Um, yeah, with, with when it comes to the nervous system, everybody's individual in terms of what needs they have. Um, the, the way I like to look at it is um, what are the things that people – tend to not do. Um, those are most likely going to be beneficial. So if you look at it from a workout standpoint, everybody going to the gym, they're thinking about what muscles do I need to work. Um, and then you have people that, that, in my opinion, are a little bit more evolved when they're thinking more in terms of what movements do I need to work. So then they're training movements and skills. I think that's great. Um, going beyond that, you can start looking at what, uh, what other system, systems am I not training so, for instance, um, you know, the, the most common uh, muscles in the body that are not worked or not trained are the eye muscles. Um, so the eye muscles, there's six different eye mus extraocular muscles that move the eyes. Um, all those provide a lot of valuable uh, proprioceptive information into the nervous system. Um, just the visual movements themselves stimulate different brain structures like the cerebellum and, and uh, brainstem and whatnot. Um, so, uh, so I think vision training is huge for most people because most people are not doing it. Uh, the most basic skill that anybody can train from a visual standpoint is to identify something that is small that they can focus on. So think about drawing a dot on the center of a paper. It could be like a letter on a business card or anything else in your environment. And just practice focusing on it. You should be able to keep your eyes on it without your without it going out of focus or without your eyes shifting or moving. Um, once you know you've got that, then you can start working your eye movements in different positions. 
So bringing an object close to you, like you know, bring it in towards your nose and push it out away from your nose, and, and, and kind of training the eyes to work together to track an object. Also, maybe drawing circles or boxes in different parts of the visual film. So you can think about the four quadrants: you got upper right, left, you know, upper left, down left, down right, and um, doing movements in each of those, as well as movements that go in all of those. Um, so vision is good. Um, there's a lot more stuff to train than just what I mentioned. Um, in terms of other training, you know, um, checking the, uh, the the vestibular system. So you can you can uh, you can do different tests on yourself where you uh, check range of motion or check your balance, and then go into different head positions and see um, how that impacts you. So, for instance. Um, uh, see, like one example of what you could do. Um, I'm trying to break this down in my head to make this a little bit more concise for everybody. So, um, when we turn our head to the right, and we're activating the um, the one of the horizontal canals on the right side, and um, just the head movement to the right should make rotation to the right easier in general. So, if you think about rotating with your arms, your right arm would be going into extension, right? So, your right yeah. arm is going back. And then your left arm would be going into flexion. So if I'm going to turn right, that's basically the movements my arms are going to make. So you can essentially check a head position with that knowledge, and you can say, okay, uh, I'm going to check my shoulder extension on the right side and my sh shoulder flexion on the left side. And then uh, if I turn my head right, it should make it easier. Um, so I should have more range of motion possibly where it feels easier. And then you can go and check that and make sure that's the case. Um, if it tests bad, like it gets worse, then it might mean that that side isn't working as well from a vestibular standpoint. Just a little simple thing you can try. OK, awesome. Well, we're going to ask you some, um, some uh, rapid fire questions now so you can uh, address some things on what you do for your own health. Um, <clears throat> what's something that you do for your health that you think not enough people know about and understand? Hmm. Um, wow. That is rapid fire. <laughs> um, let's see. Because uh, there's so many different things. I'm, I'm trying to pick out something that's been really impactful. Um, I think that people might understand this, but they still don't do it. Um, and that's uh, working on breathing. Um, so breathing is a good way to to uh, you know get the diaphragm moving, which um, is important to get the organs moving, to get the ribs moving. All that provides a lot of good stimulus up to the brain. It also kind of puts you more in that parasympathetic nervous state of rest and digest. So it's a good thing to do post workout. Um, and if you're a high stress person, maybe pre workout. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, there's a thing that uh, it was on the ZL blog recently um, called the uh, expand lung and it's like one of those training devices that you can modulate the restriction uh, that's put on breathing in and breathing out through this device. And that has been really cool working using that with some of my athletes and also myself with being able to feel um, the stress that's put on the diaphragm and getting the diaphragm working because sometimes that gets restricted. And that's one of the things that, you know, I had the opportunity to help out with uh, uh, a team of volleyball athletes. I mean, it was actually probably about 30 athletes total. And uh, I put them all through a abdominal strength assessment. And then, and then we um, uh, taught them a breathing exercise that would, that's designed to get the diaphragm moving and get the ribs moving on predominantly on one side of the body. And then, um, and then had them reassess the abdominal strength. And... Literally, um, out of the 30, it was about 26 or 27 that had improvements. Wow. And so okay. I think that that's probably representative in a lot of athlete populations is, you know, people not breathing well, um, breathing more up in the chest, not getting the diaphragm moving. And, um, you know, there's a lot of breathing stuff you can do without any device, and it's free. But, uh, you know, getting a device allows athletes to feel it more. And when they feel it more, they're more likely to actually do it. So to me, that's it's working pretty good. Yeah, I think that's an important thing for people to understand is that a lot of people understand the tips that will make them perform better and feel better, but 
if they don't have a tool that makes that um, that intervention more palatable or easier to do, then it just kind of goes by the wayside, and it kind of leans credence to the idea that the good <coughs> program that you're compliant with is better than the best program that you're not going to be compliant with. Exactly. Okay. Um, what are some of your favorite books or resources to hand out to people? Ooh. Um, man, yeah, I just found a new one recently, and I am uh, struggling to think of the name of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, I mean, from a brain standpoint, um, some, some good reading for clients. Um, you know, there's obviously, like, the, the brain that changes itself. Um, is you know a classic at this point. Um, I think there's a new one that came out, and I can't think of the title. Um, another one, if somebody's dealing with a lot of chronic pain, is a book called Explain Pain. Um, that's really good at helping helping anybody understand how pain is a process that basically happens in the the brain and nervous system. Um, so it's pretty cool to see that. Um, it kind of depends on what the person likes or needs. Um, you know, I've also handed out a book that, oh man, I think it's called like, I don't know what it's called. I can picture it. It's like One Small Step or something. It's, uh, I can find it and we can put it in the show notes. Um, okay. it, it might be called Radical Leap. It's something about behavior change. It's a really small book and it was really impactful for a lot of my clients in the past. Okay, I'll definitely look up something along those lines that will include in the show. Yeah, I can too. I can find it for you and uh, shoot you an email. Yeah, shoot me an email and then I'll include that in there for people that are listening. You'll be able to find that reference inside the show notes at HealYourselfRadio.com. Okay, um, what do you think is uh, one of the most harmful trends in health and fitness right now? Um, <laughs> well, you're making me think of all the... Uh, the videos floating around on Facebook of, <laughs> of uh, some of the things that people do to themselves. But, um, yeah, I mean, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of interesting that, um, to me, that the, you know, the way that group training is kind of, um, you know, I'm using air quotes, but, you know, taking over the fitness world, you know, it's a lot more common than it used to be. And, and I think group training has its place, and it's a good... Um, you know, it's a good model. I just, you know, one of my concerns with it is with, um, the, you know, making sure that the needs of the athlete is met because a lot of times people come into a training center and they think they know what their problem is or what they need help with, but they're actually not defining the, they're not defining the problem correctly. So they're focused on the wrong problem. Therefore, they're looking for the wrong solution. And a lot of times, you know, what's trendy is the group training it's a lot more palatable from a financial standpoint. And for a, a, a gym business, you know, they can also make more money through the leverage that, that, that it gives. And I think at some point, to some degree, you know, what the client actually needs um, kind of falls to the cracks sometimes. So I, I think that there still needs to be an element of individual training, um, whether that is people getting a lot of individualized training within a group setting or maybe a lot of individual training preceding group group training, um, you know, or just sticking with one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so I think a lot gets missed whenever you start diverting your, your focus away from a lot of these nuanced type things that I'm able to check for and find and help with in, um, in these one-on-one -on -one sessions that I'm doing. Uh, you know, when you stop and think about, you know, what is this 14-year-old gymnast, you know, what's her life going to be like if nobody is checking for, her temporal lobe function, and therefore nobody's doing anything about it. You know, what's her gymnast career going to be like, and then what's life beyond gymnastics going to look like? And it starts looking kind of stark. It's like, man, that's that could go really bad, you know? <laughs> so Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, do you have any uh, leanings as far as supplements go? Um, yeah, I mean, it's... There's a lot of good stuff out there, but there's a lot more that's that's uh, kind of a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I guess this kind of falls into your other question about trends. Um, you know, there's no 
accountability or um, supervision, you know, except for what the company does for itself, unless they hire like a third party, what is it, what is it called, the GMP, you know, the quality testing that they do, um, yeah. that's paid for. So, you know, so there's a lot of landmines out there. Um, I've had a lot of clients that were on, you know, stuff like muscle milk, and, and you, you see like consumer labs come out with their reports about the mercury and other things that they found in it, and it's just like, whoa, you know. So I think um, for me, like what I've kind of turned more to to is uh, is uh, one of the things I do is functional diagnostic nutrition. So I'm also doing some testing there. Um, so I'm a little bit more of a big uh, a fan of of actually looking at the whole system and seeing what the needs are, and then supplementing after we've gotten some changes with uh, food intake and. And, and stuff like that. Um, I don't want to turn to nutrition, uh, nutritional supplements first because um, I think it should be supplemental. And then I think that um, the more testing you can do to kind of uh, be able to see that something is changing, I think that helps out a lot um, because otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you just become like a supplement salesman. You just sell people supplements and they, you know, they're looking for something to buy into emotionally. And a lot of times people will, will do that. So when I had my gym, I had clients that, you know, I found out were spending, they couldn't afford paying the gym anymore, but they were spending 150 160 a month on supplements. And, you know, once I got them to stop taking as much um, and get more focused on nutrition, uh, meaning uh, the food that they eat and how they eat it, um, they would actually break through their plateaus and, and make a lot more improvements as a result. So it's not to say that it's all bad. It's just that I think people put too much focus on, Supplementing first instead of actually supplementing, you know, how it, how it should be. Okay. Well, I think it's a uh, good point to uh, wrap this up. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but uh, do you have any last words for our audience? And how do they find out more about you? Yeah. So, um, anybody that's got any questions or um, wants to continue the discussion or connect with me, you can do that on Facebook. Um, so it's facebook.com forward slash um, Troy Dotson. And then my website is uh, brainbasedfitnessrx.com. I've um, got a blog on there. Um, it's slowly starting to get more stuff on it. Uh, work in progress. Um, in terms of, um, I've got some notes here. I'm looking at resources. So I already gave you the myathlete.com. Um, that's a pretty good one. And then, um, yeah, that's about it, really. So um, there's also another thing for people that are interested in longevity. There's a thing called the Palo Alto Prize. Um, so it's paloaltoprize.com. And it's kind of cool because they're using HRV as their biomarker for homeostatic capacity. Um, and they're using that within the context of, like, uh, longevity research and things like that. Um, so that's something that they can go and check out if they're interested in that. All right, awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Troy. I really appreciate the information and some of the uh, the science behind using fitness to uh, make your brain better. Yeah, cool. I appreciate it. I, I love being on the show. Appreciate you inviting awesome. me. Awesome. No problem. Thanks for listening to Heal Yourself Radio. If you like what you hear, show us some love on iTunes by writing a review or by sharing with your friends. We love interacting with our listeners. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash healyourselfradio. You can find me on Twitter at Dr. Jonathan Chung. And you can always come to our website at healyourselfradio.com and interacting with us in the comments section. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.